Okay, welcome everyone, and thanks for joining us at the second of second event of our 2020-2021 uh, speaker series for the CIM MES discussion group. Uh, my name is David Robson. I'm the chair of the discussion group, and we tend to focus on any topics in the management and economics areas in in the context of the mining industry. And uh, usually, the last Wednesday of every month is is when we have our meetings, and uh, of course, this year, different format. We've had to switch to a, a virtual platform, uh, but with change comes opportunity. So we were, we're now able to have a, a much more a larger broadcast of our meetings and we can invite people from all over Canada or all over the world to, to join us to talk about interesting topics. So um, today we have a, a very interesting topic coming up, which I'll let um, our, our speakers introduce. Um, before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsors for, for hosting us on this event. So the Schulich Executive Education Centre of the Schulich School of Business uh, in Toronto, York University in Toronto. Uh, they've just generously hosted us on this virtual platform and, and of course we, we thank them for that. Um, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Professor Dimit Russos Dimitrikopoulos of McGill University will be introducing our, our, our speaker and also um, his colleague today. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending our event. I'm uh, here also to represent the Management and Economic Society of Montreal. And our speaker today is a, a well known colleague from Montreal, Guy Dagenet. Uh, the structure for today's presentation will be, there will be uh, our colleague here, Farmer from Osisco, who will introduce the speaker. And the speaker will take over the, uh, the stage. And after the his presentation is finished, we will use the Q&A um, uh, framework for questions and answers. And the general plan is to uh, keep an, uh, a meeting of about one hour. Uh, thank you for attending. We are very impressed with the, the number of people that have joined our presentation. And on this note, I would like to pass things to uh, the, the, the stage to Ian Farmer. Thank you. Hi, and welcome everyone. Um, I have the pleasure of not only working with Guy Desharnais, but also introducing him to you today. I've worked with Guy for around uh, the last three years. He is of Cisco Gold Royalties. Vice President of Evaluations. Guy holds a PhD in geochemistry and igneous petrology from the uh, University of Manitoba. He is uh, he used to be an exploration geologist with Extrata Nickel, and he has worked as a qualified person and manager of SGS Geostat for uh, seven years. Guy has also led the team that won the uh, Integra Gold Rush Challenge in 2016 and he was named a distinguished lecturer by the CIM in 2017. He is an integral part of Osisco Gold Royalty's um, executive team, and um, I'm glad to have the pr pr privilege of introducing him today. It's all yours, Guy. Uh, thank you very much, Ian. I'm gonna share my screen here. Uh, yeah, thanks for that, for that intro. And as uh, Russos mentioned, uh, if you have any questions, we're not going to allow any of you to speak, but you can use the uh, question tool at the bottom. And then you, you can actually vote for which questions you like best and the best questions will float to the top and uh, I'll go through those uh, at the end of the, the presentation. So as Ian mentioned, uh, my job is to evaluate projects. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm a geologist and I'm sort of the gatekeeper of new opportunities that come into Osisco. So I, I get the privilege of, of taking the first crack at things. Uh, and uh, over the years, I've come up with some rules of thumb and just general practices, which allow me to and our team to really uh, identify the best projects early and then uh, move those forward. So that's what we'll be talking about today. Uh, so just to mention, many of you probably don't know what MES is. It's actually, I learned this only last year. It's Management and Economic Society. So it's sort of a subgroup within CIM. Uh, we established a group in Montreal and uh, 
we only had the, the privilege of a single meeting, uh, some wine and little sandwiches, and then COVID hit us. So uh, we're happy to, to keep going this way and hopefully we'll all get out uh, and see each other with uh, glasses of wine soon enough. Uh, I'd like to start with a quick uh, safety share. So we're all stuck in our in front of our laptop computers now for, for a good reason. Uh, I think many of us expected us to get back and running quickly uh, after schools shut down in the spring. Um, I'd like to, to I'd like to think that you know we'll we'll round the corner soon, but uh, I think the expectation is we're going to be uh, a bit behind closed doors for a while. So uh, make sure that uh, you you're, you're take care of your mental health and you check on people that that uh, that you love uh, in your life, and just make sure everybody feels available to to discuss and and express how they. Uh, so I'm going to have a few shocking statements throughout this. The first one here is a little bit sarcastic, but uh, out of the 1,200 exploration companies that are on the Toronto Stock Exchange or the Australian Stock Exchange, uh, most of these are, are not economic. Uh, we have I've compiled a lot of the uh, feasibility and preliminary economic assessments available for these projects, and I have a simple histogram here showing that the IRR, the internal rate of return for these, uh, and you can see that you know the bulk of them are sitting at 20% or higher. This is sort of a, an artificial standard that uh, are often communicated to the consultants is, is let's let's get above this threshold to have a, a good report. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about you know how what the reality is between behind these these projects. So I compiled uh, 50 of the projects that we've evaluated to see where are these projects failing. Um, following a due diligence with the Osisco team. And I was surprised actually how uh, several of them failed on many different aspects. I expected more failures in the geology side. I'm biased because I'm a geologist and I, I see those faults uh, stand out very well. Uh, but we also see lots of mining processing at the smelter level, uh, the op operating costs, the capital expenditures or ESG. Um, many of these projects end up being good projects nonetheless, but about half of them, uh, we were not able to recommend investing in them. Uh, basically, the, the faults that we found, uh, the shortcomings of the projects were, were not really, uh, there was no obvious uh, solution to those problems and therefore they're, they're basically considered incurable. Um, on, on the geology side, obviously that's it's something that I, I'm, I'm passionate about and we've seen several projects have have really significant failures over the past few years. Uh, one that stands out for us uh, in Canada is, is Rubicon, which was uh, really high, highly uh, mediatized and, and we discussed it quite significantly and it's really at the front of, of mind. But since that event, we've had several other projects that have either reduced the reserves or the head grade, uh, six in, in mainly in Canada and Australia. So we're not the only ones in the world that have uh, have had issues with this, and in many in many cases, these are big, uh, respected, qualified persons and com consulting companies that are working on the projects. Uh, and I have a, a little picture here of a sign I saw while traveling in Colombia. And for me, this is uh, a little bit the excuse that keeps being brought up to explain why these these reserves have, have failed, uh, and it's chalked up to the to the geological instability. And to me, this is a little bit hilarious, but I think because at the end of the day, it was still a human who, uh, human engineer who decided where to put that road and, and undercut the road and, and made the situation dangerous. The underlying geology doesn't have really an impact. And at the end of the day, we need to do our jobs correctly. So I'll start with looking at, you know, where we're seeing these geological failures, the resource overestimations. Uh, I can speak on this subject for two hours, but this is sort of the one slide version of of the explanation of the most of these failures that we see. It all starts with the lack of, of drilling. Drilling is relatively expensive and therefore we try to save money by not, by not, by doing the minimum that we can to have the most uh, ounces or, or tons of metal as we can. Uh, this results in a qualified person who attempts, does their best to try to create a solid model around the, the mineralized part of the economic part of that mineralization. Uh, oftentimes, particularly with precious metal deposits, these tend to be small and relatively discontinuous structures. Uh, 
And without sufficient information, oftentimes the, the qualified person ends up giving up and creating a, a solid model that's much wider that captures the mineralization and all the mineralization, all the, the, the mineralization is contained within it. However, there's a lot of zeros that are dra dragged along, uh, a lot of waste rock that's dragged along through the model. So in this here, we have two different histograms. The top histogram is the raw assays from a real uh, gold deposit. And at the bottom here, we have the block model that re resulting from the, ass the uh, estimation. And what we see is that the, the histogram is, is deformed. And the reason is intrinsically the process by which we do block model interpolation is we're, we're making averages. So we take data that's spread out into space between two drill holes. The block that's located uh, exactly between the two is taking the data that's available from those two holes and is taking an average of the weighted average of that data between those holes. And the act of averaging deforms the shape of the histogram, deforms the shape of, of the resulting uh, block model, which overall the result, the average grade between those two histograms are the same. The, the, the underlying structure of the data is what's changed. And what the damage comes when you apply a cutoff grade. So applying a cutoff grade to the assays or the block model results in, in a different result. You tend to get more blocks of higher grade. The more smoothing you do, the stronger your averaging is. And if you started off with a solid that doesn't contain only ore, then you're spreading, you're smearing that those higher grade samples into a greater area and you're creating a volume of mineralization. And then, the qualified person has a, an opportunity to declassify these resources that don't belong in, in the resource model, that don't fit the criteria put forth by the CIM to define what's a resource. Uh, there's, a, there's different tools we can use, but generally speaking, uh, the geostatistics is over, overly relied upon to, to apply the classification. Uh, and poor understanding of the limitations of these tools is, it leads us to, to often see overclassification where we're allowing too many of the blocks to be uh, classified as, as resources at all. Uh, in some cases, they shouldn't be resources. And then we put them into indicated or measured where they should be inferred or, or worse. So my job, uh, one of my jobs is to be the gatekeeper of new projects that come into our house within Osisco. Uh, and if I, we have a team of, of mining engineers and process engineers and tailings people, and before I let them loose to find the, the, the faults within the different projects, if I can identify the dogs, the projects that don't deserve investment, if I can identify those earlier, then I'm saving everybody time and helps us concentrate on the projects that deserve uh, more attention. Uh, the key, uh, the key way we can do this is identifying what are the biggest uh, slices of investment that are required to make this project go forward. So for example, if a project has a very high capex, is very capital intensive, uh, then we can start looking in that piece at first. And if we, if we can peel off all those, those, those pieces of, of capex, uh, we don't find any major faults and much, we're much more less likely to find uh, errors that are going to uh, kill the project. So oftentimes we find a construction period too short. When we're discounting the future cash flows of our projects, uh, we tend to have the, the, the early time is much more impactful. So a shorter construction period looks better in Excel, but in reality, it's un unrealizable. Uh, camp costs are underestimated. So as we're having more and more mines that are fly in, fly out, um, we have higher proportion of mines that require a camp and the costs of building it and operating it are often underestimated. Earthworks and indirects as well are often underestimated. Uh, if we have a project that has a very high strip ratio, then first thing we would look at is, okay, what's the mining cost that they're applying? Uh, you can sometimes cheat by, by saying you can mine the waste for a lower price than your ore. Uh, there's reasons why that can, in certain cases, be real, but in often, oftentimes the, the real rebate is not as high as, as proposed. If the high operating cost operation or project, then uh, looking at the number of sal number of employees that are actually working there, uh, if it's a project in Africa or another developing uh, country or continent, uh, 
looking at the number of expats, there's a certain number of qualified persons you need to bring in to, to operate properly. Uh, and for projects that are, again, very far from ports, uh, what's, the, what's the cost structure for the fuel or the concentrate for those projects? Um, we also want to look for operational bottlenecks. Um, we like to, uh, when we're, 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 we're designing a project, we have a tendency to make things really big because then we can bring the unit costs down. Um, off, oftentimes we see a misfit between the size of the processing plant and what the mine is capable to deliver. So in open pit mining, it's fairly easy to throw more equipment into the, into the study. Uh, you, can, you can mine more tons more quickly and stockpile low grade. However, for underground mines, it's a lot more difficult. You need a certain number of working faces where you can drill, blast, and, and remove the material. And you have to take into consideration the cycle time. So uh, it's not just removing the material before you take the next stope over, you need to backfill, cement, let that curing time. Uh, and so a lot of people take that uh, for granted and, and have operations that are not actually uh, actionable. <clears throat> uh, ore hardness is, is something that is underestimated its impact. Oftentimes you will be, uh, your processing plant will have to, will be forced into a trade-off between meeting the throughput that is designed or letting the material grind for a longer period of time and, and accessing the, the recovery. So uh, in either case, that rock hardness uh, can, be very, can be very costly. Uh, here's a quote from, from, a press, from a press release from earlier this year. The company implemented smaller mining benches and split pushback phases to accelerate access to the main ore body. However, the smaller operating area resulted in a reduced productivity rates from increased congestion and delays in the drilled blast load site. So where you think you found a solution to, to unlock value, there's almost always a trade-off. And, and oftentimes, as humans, we tend to look only at the benefits of, of taking a decision uh, and not at the cost. The second shocking statement uh, for today is that the, the slam dunk projects, the ones that are high value, simple mining, uh, good jurisdiction are extremely rare and are not usually available for investment. Uh, those projects that have amazing drill hole intersections and you're like, wow, let's, let's get involved. Uh, by the time you know, we, we, we talk to the groups and even if we have a relationship with them and, and we know them, uh, they know they can raise equity on their own. And so uh, we sort of, you know, within the royalty business and other other debt or equity businesses, they, it's uh, the limits for getting into a project and getting some of the benefit is is quite uh, quite obvious and limited. Uh, and so I was trying to find a good analog for what my job is like, and this is as close as I can get. So I hope most of you know the uh, the reality TV show Storage Wars. Essentially, it's this group of characters that's uh, goes to a storage locker unit. Uh, the, the, the unit holder, the owner of the unit did not pay his bills and therefore they have an auction to see who, who gets the material, but they don't get to go, go through and see what's in all these boxes in, in the back. So uh, it's very similar to the process of, of when we're looking into a new project and we know there's other people involved. Usually the asset is flawed. Uh, the asset is, is shown to us in the best possible light. We have incomplete information. Uh, oftentimes it's a phased bid and we're only given a little bit of information at a time. Uh, we want to adjust our bids for, for risk. We don't know what's in the boxes. We don't know what's, what are some of the long-term impacts, the permitting issues and other impacts. Uh, and it's a competitive environment. So you want to put your best foot forward, but you don't want to overpay. So you're sort of stuck with, with uh, incomplete information and, and you need to, to, to make go at it. And oftentimes you'll see at the end of the show, uh, somebody has to go home and they didn't buy a locker and they have a store of used stuff that they, they're, they're left empty and it's, it's a very, very sad sight. And we see some of the royalty companies now that feel a lot of pressure to, to be buying, uh, buying projects to, to, kill, to keep the, the shelves full. So almost every project has some superficial fault and it's very easy to say, we don't want to invest in this project. Uh, the mining cost is too high or you know, the elevation is too high. It's going to be too hard. So let's forget about it. But we need to 
to find uh, value within these projects nonetheless. And there's a few cases where technology can save the day. <clears throat> uh, or sorting is something we were asking our question for every project now. It essentially allows you to, uh, to pick material after the crushing stage, you have a coarse crush and you can reject waste and, and, and upgrade the material that will be fed to your mill. Sometimes these ore sorting units can be installed underground and you can directly send your waste to, to use backfill. So there's lots of advantages in that way. Uh, continuous mining, I think we're going to see more and more of that. The uh, Caribou project that we're, we're that Cisco Development is, is working on is going to be testing road headers. Uh, you need the right kinds of rock, but there's lots of benefits in terms of uh, uh, rock bolting, reducing the, the, the requirement for, for geotechnical support. Uh, and potentially, you know, automation and lots of other opportunities to, to make your project look, look better. Uh, automation, obviously, we're going towards a more robotic age. If we can keep people from going underground, then that's one fewer person, and that robot doesn't need to uh, take a coffee break or, or a cigarette, so uh, we can be more pr productive and also more cost efficient. And for ores that have always been considered to be refractory, be it for uh, usually it's for gold and silver, where the gold is locked up in different minerals. Uh, there are very uh, expensive and messy ways to break up those sulfide minerals, uh, but there are more and more people working on solutions that are that are more cost effective and and less uh, difficult to access the precious metals. Uh, again. Writing off a project is easy. Looking at what is the remaining value uh, is a lot more difficult. Um, sometimes when we're looking at a project, we, we find a, a fault that doesn't seem like it's, it's too dramatic, but because the, the project is not so robust, uh, it falls into a, a doom vortex. So this is, this is an example here where uh, we, we, we have a block model uh, and let's say I look at the block model, I say, you know, this, there's a problem here. This is the new, the new grade or the new interpretation. We run a new Whittle optimization for the pit. The pit is smaller. Uh, now the processing plant is misfit. So we need to use a smaller processing plant. Scale goes down, the operating cost goes up. And then we go back to the block model and say, well, this, is this new operating? Do we have a, the, the shape of the blocks uh, the continuity at the grade that we need to make this work. And then we can go back and back. It gets smaller and everything gets smaller until everything disappears. So that, uh, there, are, there are cases though where we can actually do a reverse doom vortex where we add value in a certain way. And all of a sudden we see that the, the, the available material for the, for the mineral inventory uh, grows and we can go bigger and, and it makes more sense. Uh, and now we're gonna look at a few different Economic uh, metrics, we'll go through these uh, individually. And this is one that's uh, I sort of had in my mind. And then finally, when somebody asked me, like, how do you know if, it, if this is good or not? Uh, I said, well, you know, this, this is a tool that we can use and put it down on paper. Uh, it's more or less calibrated, and you'll see uh, what we're, we'll go through some examples. But uh, essentially, on the y axis here, we have the grade. So you can transform any grade into dollars, and that makes it quite quite universal. And then in the horizontal axis here, we have the horizontal thickness. Uh, if you are above the line, so the higher the grade, the higher the thickness, you're more likely to be above the line. That, that would correspond to ore, and below that, you would, would be non-economic deposit. And the reasoning behind this is, is, is fairly obvious. So the higher the grade, the, the better the value. So the more valuable your ore, the more likely it is it's economic. That's obvious. Um, but the thickness is a little bit uh, less uh, clear for some people. So uh, there's two main aspects. The first one is the thicker the, your, your mineralization, uh, the more likely you have large tonnage. Uh, large tonnage means you can have a bigger processing plant and bigger equipment, and then your cost uh, structure goes down and it allows you to, to have a, a lower cutoff rate and just a more economic deposit. Uh, but the horizontal thickness also speaks to the continuity. So the more, the thicker your intersections are, the more likely you'll find other thick intersections and that you'll be able to find a shape of mineralization, which is going to be easy to, to pick out the good versus the bad. 
Uh, Knorland is a, uh, a small uh, junior private company uh, that made a discovery in Quebec recently. I think they won an award uh, in Quebec for discovery of the year at the Explore conference this year. Um, and they put together a nice compilation of uh, here we have drill hole intersect thickness versus the total gold within the deposit. So it's not exactly the same uh, X and Y axis, but just to show you that the thickness of the intersection is really important. Uh, it's fairly easy to get a, a one meter, 20 gram per ton intersect, uh, but to get a, a nice thick one where you can link it to other ones, uh, it's a lot more challenging. And here's another graph from the same company. Um, and we can see, uh, again, this is more, it's closer to the, to, the, to the graph that I was showing. So it's intersect length versus grade thickness. So we're showing thickness twice here. So that's, we have sort of an artificial uh, trend that's due to the fact we're using the same uh, parameter twice, but uh, it just goes to show that a lot of the gold deposits, uh, the Quebec ones, plot very clearly in this upper right quadrant, which is uh, pretty much exactly what we would expect. Uh, and in terms of transforming our metals into, into dollars, this is, um, is a, sort of just a table of different pricing. And some of these pricing are, are way out of whack today, particularly uh, gold and silver. Uh, but I like to sort of put these into, into big average prices so it makes it easier to transform. And when you first get presented a project, you can make sense of it. So uh, in my previous life working for Falconbridge, which became Extrata, which became Glencore, uh, we were looking for a Falconbridge class deposit. And that was basically 20 million tons of 2% nickel. And that's sort of, you know, the, 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 the smart engineers of, of the company back in the day figured out, you know, to make an underground deposit of 20 million tons, it'll take about 2% nickel to make it work. And they told the geologists like, don't come back until you find something like this. And this is sort of my frame of, rest, my frame of reference for that scale of deposit. Um, and then, so how do I, so when we're looking at a copper deposit or a gold deposit, how do we put that in that frame of reference? And it's just a rule of thumb, but it's, I, it's actually quite useful for, for, for that case. And so it's, it's kind of useful to think of nickel as being twice as valuable as copper. So nickel is at $10,000 a ton and copper is at $5,000 a ton. And zinc as being one quarter of nickel or half of copper. So if we go back to the Falconbridge class deposit, uh, zinc, you would need a, an 8% zinc deposit of 20 million tons to be economic, which turns out that's pretty much what, what, uh, what we would like to see in a, in a BMS deposit uh, in North America. So that fits pretty well. And there's actually a, um, a useful coincidence between the copper grade expressed in percent and the gold grade expressed in grams per ton. They just happen to be 10,000 times one versus the other. So if you have a porphyry deposit that's 1% uh, copper and one gram per ton gold, you can easily, and it's not perfect, especially with the, the price to form the way it is now, but you can say it's a 2% copper equivalent or a two gram per ton gold equivalent. And then you make an adjustment for the way that the prices are recently. But you can sort of swing back and forth between those two because the coincidence of this unit transformation. And so obviously when we're uh, looking at uh, different projects, we can't just put everything on the same plot. There's lots of uh, factors which go into defining what the economics of the project. So if the project is underground, it's fly in, fly out. You need to generate your own power. It's fine grains. It's hard ore. It's low recovery. That threshold for what's economic goes up. You need more grade or more thickness to make it work. Whereas if you're in town, uh, you have coarse soft ore, high recovery and open pit, and that, that, that threshold comes down. So if you think about the, the Canadian Malarctic mine, which is the, the biggest gold mine uh, in Canada now, it benefited from a lot of these factors. Uh, even though that they had to move part of the village away, the fact that they were uh, right in town, the workforce is there, they had good access to power and, and um, made, made it so that the project was, was successful. And I have this line drawn as a straight line, but, but obviously uh, we could add complexity here. So this is um, flotation 
operating costs in red for a flotation plant. The x-axis is scale. So we're sort of in the same realm of, of thinking here where thicker means bigger and bigger deposit means we can have a bigger uh, processing plant. And on the y-axis, we have the operating cost uh, on the left and the capital, the capex on the right. So the operating cost on a per ton basis will go down as you scale up. And this is obvious for people that have done projects, uh, evaluations. So going from a 500 ton per day deposit or processing plant to a 5,000 ton per day processing plant, there's quite a lot of savings to be had there. But one thing that to note here is actually your, your, your curve is, is flattening. So the benefit of scaling up beyond a certain point uh, becomes less and less important. Uh, note that the, the X axis here is not uh, linear. So we're jumping, we're doubling almost every, every quadrant. Uh, this is a similar plot, but we're now we're showing leaching for gold. And now we have uh, in the X axis linear scale. And you can see this, this price, this op the operating costs on a dollars per ton basis drop precipitously in the beginning, but beyond 10,000 tons, those benefits are, are a lot less marked a lot less important. Uh, and the reason is that your a lot of the costs that you'll have um, at the higher scale, you're not benefiting from, from the scale. So you've already maxed out your biggest sag mill. You've already, you're, you have the same number of staff people. So your main drivers of costs, the, the, the additional tonnage that you were gonna be processing are fixed. So it's power for crushing and grinding, you can't really save on that. It's all your additives and your consumables related to, to the processing itself. And you you can't really save on those items. If we look at a heap leach, this is actually quite interesting because uh, the heap leach process doesn't involve a lot of those fixed costs. So you don't, in a lot of cases, you, you, you don't do crushing at all or you do very little. And that, that piece is actually variable where in certain cases, you you will do crushing and stacking in a, in a different technology, and also so this is sort of taking out those fixed costs of of human per ton and energy per ton, and you're looking more here at how much cyanide or acid you're consuming on a per ton basis. So there's a lot more variability uh, and a lot more fuzziness uh, with scale. There's a lot less savings as you increase the scale of your operation. Uh, mining rate again this. It's, uh, I was surprised by how little, uh, how much variability there is here, but uh, there is um, quite a bit of variability here. Some of this is labor costs or, or energy costs um, or the size of the equipment available. When you're going to underground mining, uh, you're, you can't just scale up the way you want. The geological continuity is gonna tell you, first of all, whether you can mine it big oftentimes you know thin vein you're you're stuck in one in one method um but also the geotechnical constraints so can your roof support a certain span of open rock and if you can't then you need to use a smaller method so going from left to right we're we're using we're very very selective but high cost on the left and in, in this case shrinkage is not really used in Canada anymore because it's too selective, too dirty. You can't find people that want to have a, a jack leg spraying water and dust in their face. Uh, to the least selective, where you basically block caving, you're you're no longer blasting uh, to break up the rock. You just have a huge span of rock you're picking up from from the base of of uh, of the pile. So if you look at some of the the deposits that we've invested in over the years, obviously they're 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 spanning across this entire graph. So for example, windfall, which is relatively thin, but very high grade uh, compared to Gibraltar, which is the second largest copper mine in Canada, uh, relatively low grade, but very, very thick. So the, you get the, the, the savings of economies of scale. But even at a very early stage, you know, when I'm looking at a new project, I'm, I'm gonna think in, in the framework of, of this graph. So here's some surface outcrop samples and I can say, well, this it's good or it's bad, and then I have, if it's if it's lower grade, then I'm I know that I need to go very far thickness to make this work. Um, once we've gotten some saw cuts and a little bit of that second dimension, then we can start saying, okay, well we're somewhere in this range. We have a, an idea of where we're going to be. 
Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, we need drilling and drilling gives us that third dimension. Uh, it's expensive, but important. One of the very uh, under, underappreciated aspects of exploration and mine development mine development is the great continuity. So seeing 20 holes in a row that have a grade and thickness that's, that's, that's always consistent and that I can easily draw a solid around that will give me a lot more confidence uh, in, terms of, in terms of the economics, but also the mineability. And that's something that uh, when you're applying a cutoff grade on the block model, it, you can do that in Excel and it, it'll spit out a beautiful table, but it doesn't say anything about how mineable that that block model is. So that continuity is very important. I like to see a um, histogram of the assays within the solids. That'll give me a very good clue immediately of how continuous the, the mineralization is. If I see a whole bunch of zeros and then only a fraction of the material that's above my, my estimated cutoff grade, then I, I know there's the higher geological risk. And for precious metal deposits where the distribution of the assays is typically not a nice bell curve, but it's log normal, so lots of zeros and long tail, uh, the, the average grade is very misleading. I'd like to see what the median grade is. And that gives me a quick clue of you know, how this thing will turn out once we get all through the steps, of the, the modeling and the resource estimation. Metric number two, grain size and mineralogy. So we can tell even before metallurgical tests, if we have nice coarse grain, mineralization and that the precious metals, for example, are on the edges of certain minerals that gives us a nice clue that it's going to be easily extracted. And depending on where the precious metals are located and how we extract them through the processing, it gives us a good idea of how, how, much we're, how easy it's going to be and how much we're going to get paid. So for example, gold recovered by gravity is paid at 99.5, whereas gold that's found within zinc concentrates is, is penalized by you know 20 to or 15 10 to, to 30 percent depending on on your concentration and, and your smelter so the smelter likes to take a nice cut off the top there uh, when we're looking at cutoff grade a lot of people don't understand that the, the the typical cutoff grade that we see is a marginal cutoff grade so that ton of ore that's exactly at the cutoff grade is not making us a profit it's exactly break even and oftentimes uh, for open pit mining, we're not even considering the mining cost in that. And we're definitely not counting the CapEx. So to test the robustness of a project, we like to push that, that, that cutoff grade a little bit higher and see how much of the resources actually survive that and gives us an idea of robustness. And sort of a rule of thumb, if the amount of material that's above cutoff grade is more than double the the, the Sorry, if the average grade of the material above cutoff is twice the cutoff, then we, we know we have a very robust project where we're, we're making a profit on most tons and then that profit is gonna help to pay for the CapEx and uh, keep the project running for years. Um, but the geology will, will impose to us a ceiling on that cutoff grade. So this is an example, it's a gold deposit uh, in Quebec called Beza uh, and you can see it Three different cutoffs. So in the red is material above the cutoff and gray is waste. Uh, as we increase the cutoff grade, you can see in this example that we sort of shred apart the mineralization, the continuity is lost. So geologically, it would be extremely difficult to mine this, the VESA deposit at a cutoff of five grams per ton. But bring it back down to three, then we have something that's much, much more manageable on a mining scale and a lot lower risk uh, geologically. I did a compilation of, of uh, feasibility studies for base and precious metals uh, over the years. I had to lump together some, some years because there weren't uh, sufficient studies to actually look at. Uh, and there's some pretty clear trends that, that come out of that. So these are box plots. The, the box itself for each one, each year here is essentially uh, the 50% of the most typical around the median. So it's the 25 percentile and the 75 percentile. And the dot is the average for, for that, that bin of years. Uh, so you can see, you know, generally the trend is towards 20% IRR. We saw that on the first histogram. And over the last few years, we seem to see a trend towards increasing IRR. Uh, NPV or the net present value, uh, we had in 
2012-2013 when uh, the, the, the metals boom was was never going to stop and China was going to buy any metal that we ever produce and everybody was super optimistic. Uh, there was no limit on how big and how uh, uh, optimistic we were on the, the projects that we built. We see uh, in, th in the intervening years during the bear, bear market, we sort of changed our tune. And you can see that more clearly in this graph showing the capex versus the years. Uh, whereas in uh, 2018 to 2013, we were less shy to make these big billion dollar CapEx projects. Uh, and then the investment community came back to us and said, no, no, people, uh, I want, can't you make this smaller and more investable? And that's sort of what we've seen over the years. So it'll be very interesting to see if we go back towards these, these mega projects in the years to come. And the net result actually is a better uh, profitability index. So the profitability index is essentially just NPV over CapEx. Which, the, it, which is a little bit awkward because to estimate the NPV, the CapEx is already in there. So you're sort of double counting it, but it's, it's essentially how much, how much profit you will build per unit CapEx you put in the beginning. And so what we see is a very clear trend of increasing profitability index. So the projects are, are you know, sharpening their pencils and looking for ways to um, maximize NPV for the, the least amount of initial capital expenditure. Uh, and the final metric here is the time to actual production. So we see this type of plot very often. We're going to be very aggressive timeline. Uh, in reality, uh, where projects fail is, you know, oftentimes to get to a feasibility study, you need a certain number of indicated resources. So the, often that takes longer than expected to drill off and estimate those resources. And at the permitting stage, we see uh, lots of appeals dragging on, uh, elections which are causing delays, or you know the great the big permits are obtained, but those those little ones that don't seem important at the time can cause more delays for for an investor or a project owner. Uh, those can be quite painful when we, we think about time value of money. Uh, the final shocking statement of the day is that uh, decision makers will not read your forty page report. So, as scientists, we think. Uh, uh, we put a lot of love and effort into our our evaluations of projects, and then we. We, tr we put that in, in what we think is a summary and provide that to our managers and the board of directors. But at the end of the day, uh, we're better to provide them a, a much smaller summary and have them refer to a larger report on the side. And that, that communication is really important because like, like the same, we, they need to be concentrating their efforts on, on the right project as well. So this is the, the sort of a dashboard that we came up with uh, that outlines the the risks and the value of these, these projects. And you can quickly see here, we have three different dashboards with three different results. And without looking at the information, you can, it jumps out at you that there's, there's, there's some good and some bad, some green and some red in these. And we'll go over uh, how this is constructed. Uh, so generally speaking, red is bad, green is good. And that is a measure of the likelihood that this factor, so in this case, mining method and OPEX, is going to be a significant trap, uh, contributor to the project failure. Um, whereas in this case, processing, I'm not worried about it. Mining, I'm very worried about it. And then the width of the bar is really informative too, because it gives the reader uh, a value of how sure we are, myself, the, the technical people, how sure we are that we've, we've done our work and we've done the sufficient homework and we have sufficient tests. So if we have a feasibility study, for example, or they're already in operation, then I'm very sure of my risk. I know what the risk is. It's very narrow. But if we're at a resource es estimation stage, or I don't believe their number, I know I need to do more homework. I just read the press release. This is my information. Then I can have a much wider bar. And so the idea with this dashboard is we include it for every level of, of study that we do, and we update it. So as we learn about the project, that bar shrinks and it moves along uh, to where we better understand where we are. Uh, we include the information of who did the work based on what. So, you know, if it's based on a press release or in-depth review of the, the, the feasibility study, that's important information. And we include that here. Um, we don't summarize what's in the technical report. We're summarizing what's different in our opinion compared to that technical report or that, that, that study. 
uh, we're adding information, we're not summarizing information. And the recommendation here is always a fight between myself and my, my, my super talented crew, whereas they want to recommend more metallurgical tests and other things. And I'm like, no, that space is reserved for how we are going to change the cash flow model uh, for the, the, the corporate development guys. So they need to make a decision on how we're adjusting the project. Is it better or worse? How much better or worse? And so this is, is really tough. We need to put on our big boy pants and put a number down on, you know, this the CapEx is underestimated, this is the number, right? And that's that's really the difficult part of, of our job is coming up with those real numbers that we we, we need to sit down and, and establish. Uh, for the exploration potential, this is important. Uh, oftentimes we're bidding on projects, the, the mineral inventory is incomplete. We know that there is exploration potential and, and on the royalty and stream, we like to have them go on to infinity. So how do you evaluate how many how many infinities are there going to be? Um, well, we need to what we what we do is we apply a probability weighted exploration potential. So it lives between a, a, this is a, just one example here. So a P10 to P90. So the P10 is a very low probability. So this is our bull case. So the question we ask ourselves is, would I be surprised if that the the additional res, reserve estimate is 40 million tons of four grants per ton? And this is always in the context of only the economic part of that exploration potential, because what's what's a hairy fairy conceptual target that has low grade and will not be a mine should not be accounted here because we're only counting economic ton. Uh, and then we also give a P90, which is which is a very bare case. So I would be surprised if the addition was lower than this, and then a likely case. So this is very useful for the, the corporate development guys because it gives them an opportunity to say, we really love this project. Uh, it makes sense for a number of reasons. We want to be aggressive because we know other people are going to be bidding on it. And then they can choose within the risk realm here and they have to live with the risk uh, that we provide here, um, how to, to apply the best bid for, for allowing us to, to do that. And the tools we use for that are, are relatively qualitative. I mean, it's impossible to estimate reserves on something that hasn't been drilled out yet, uh, but there's some science. GSC does some work uh, using permissive tracks or doing surveys of experts to try to figure out how much is left. And, you know, this is the, the sort of the fun part of the geology is trying to invent deposits that don't get exist. And at the end, we, uh, we provide uh, an upside in that probability range and a recommendation which tends to be as clear as possible on you know, we move forward or not. So whereas most projects are flawed, uh, there's always something wrong with it. If it was super easy, it would usually be already mined. Uh, quantifying those adjustments to the financial model requires an experience in multidisciplinary team, which we have here. We're lucky to have some, some uh, excellent mining engineers and metallurgists and, and tailings people that have worked in real operations that know uh, what it takes to make uh, make a mine, uh, and then rigorous stage evaluation with clear, comprehensive reporting allows optimal decision making. So this dashboard is sort of we attach it to every level of study we do. Uh, it's useful to see the evolution of it, but if someone doesn't have time to go through a, a, a more detailed dil due diligence that we will do, it, it provides sort of a snapshot of of that. So thank you very much. I'm going to go now to the Q and A. So again, you can go vote and add questions or vote on the questions you like, and they'll get uh, sequentially upgraded uh, with time. So we have 10 minutes. We'll see how many we can get through here. So the first question is, uh, does Osisco utilize any sort of parametric resource evaluation tools, software to aid in the evaluation process, commercially available or in-house? Uh, we keep it pretty simple. Like in my experience, uh, the more complicated the math is on, on something, the more likely it is you're, you're going to create errors. And oftentimes, I'll have to redo the resource estimation. I, and uh, I, uh, I use a tool that I, I learned uh, through my previous job. It's called Genesis. Um, and if I need to use something a little bit more uh, mathy, then I can... Uh, I, those tools are actually integrated in that software, or I can deal with some uh, consultants that are specialized in, in those methods. 
à Eric Lemieux. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned Eleonora Little, gone from 8 million ounces to 2.3 million ounces and far from having even produced 3 million ounces of gold. Drill spacing, oh, it's been downloaded here. Drill spacing was insufficient. Uh, drill spacing was insufficient or geology misinterpreted? Uh, this is a really good question. I can't really get into it too much because we have obviously, uh, we have a, ro uh, a royalty on this project and I have some information. Um, it's um, it's also changed hands. This project, uh, I think it's I think the initial drilling created so much exuberance uh, because when you combined all the, all the the high grade intervals together, it made it look like this big gigantic continuous thing. And oftentimes in any project, and I'm not talking about Eleanor specifically, as you add more drilling things. Uh, get more com complicated so that might be one of the explanations so in this case you know both of your explanations i think are 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 potentially true here uh you have seen you have seen some great projects fail and some marginal projects succeed depending on teams in place do you evaluate project teams or do you keep people out of the evaluation no this is actually we have uh we've we've changed our matrix a little bit and we management is one of the, the big ones and so the management team uh, that's that's there is one of the really key important factors in evaluating projects. Uh, there's a lot of uh, lifestyle uh, lifestyle types of companies out there that are uh, they're happy to have their project put a new corporate presentation every every month and make sure that they have just enough news to, to keep things going. Uh, and finding great teams that are there to actually build out mines is is becoming one of the major challenges. So yeah, that's definitely uh, one of the things that, that we look out for. It's hard to evaluate sometimes. Track record is a big thing, but as we're as as staffs are maturing and retiring, uh, people that have have built three or four mines are are becoming more and more rare. So we're one of the advantages within the Cisco is we have some of those mind builders. So those companies that are sister companies have access at least to the to the brain trust to to, to make those right decisions. But uh, that's a good point. Um, can you comment on the usefulness of the McNulty curves? Oh, I lost it there. The McNulty curves to estimate the ramp up of the recoveries and plant throughput at the start of an operation. You usually find that these are optimistic and technical reports issued by companies. Um, I'm not sure. I don't want to misspeak here. I'm only a geologist. McNulty curves, I think, is maybe the 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 uh, the, the grade recovery curves. Um, if you guys want to add something on there, yes, sir. Maybe. McNulty curves. It's the ramp up of a new operation, like how fast it can get up to a certain capacity, or that. Yeah. That yeah. yeah, so uh, generally speaking, I think people are are too optimistic. Uh, it's always put down as as a um, uh, everything goes right situation, uh, and people underestimate how small factors combine to make two small problems become a big problem, uh, and those usually take a little bit of extra infrastructure and getting the right studies and infrastructure in place to get to the full full uh, full bandwidth is really uh, more difficult yeah generally that's that's it's the construction period but also yeah the ramp up period can can often be a little bit underestimated but that's that's a human that's a human fault i'm not sure that's uh, specific to 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 mining uh, how do you estimate operating costs typically i see operating costs are not well evaluated especially early on if you are testing different pits with whittle let's say and you want to account for uncertainty and operating costs, how can you evaluate the reserve? Each, at each different price will have a different fit and different amount of metal, which you care about as a royalty company. At the end of the day, which pit you, do you choose and is it fair to assess the amount of metal for each operating cost with a different size? So that's a very good question. It's a hard one to answer. And unfortunately I have some extremely smart people that I work exactly on this type of uh, problem that I worked in house here with me. Um, I'll, I'll, 
instead of answering your question clearly at, at an, a level of complexity, is oftentimes in the reserves, uh, when we, we do the feasibility studies and reserves are estimated, they don't take the marginal cutoff pit, right? They'll choose one that's slightly smaller and produces a better IRR. So on a di time discounted basis, it looks better. Uh, but in reality, it's, it's worse. And they say, well, you know, when we get to year 10, then we'll push back and we'll have a better project. Um, how do we estimate the operating costs? We, we rely fairly heavily on uh, real life um, examples that we have uh, because we have the, the, the luxury of, of visiting many mine sites and we have royalties on operating mines, we have access and we have a database of, of, of costs that we can refer to. And then you sort of need to adjust based on, you know, this is fly and fly out or the trucks are gonna be bigger or smaller. And we adjust that way. Um, yeah, interesting question. I'll keep going here. How much does exploration potential play in a decision? Would a very marginal project be accepted if your geologist felt there was a big exploration potential? Yeah, so that's a that's a that's a very good point, and it depends on the project. So if we have a project that already has twenty years of mine life, then adding another ten years beyond that doesn't add a lot of value for us. Um, but we are looking, and we do invest in projects that have spectacular exploration potential, uh, and it's it's unrecognized by uh, by the market or the public. The company is not public yet. Uh, we will put in money into those types of opportunities because it's a huge bang for the buck, especially if it's a if it's a type of project that that has huge scale potential, because once they've drilled that first hole of 600 meters of 2% copper, uh, there, there's, there's no room for us to, to step in there and help them out. You know, we need, in certain cases, we need to bypass and, and get in there earlier. Um, and so we will look more closely for projects that have a shorter life of mine. Uh, and the, the exploration potential will be leaned on a little bit more. So we'll spend more time looking at what the potential is, what the tools that had been used previously uh, what the success rate was, uh, and so forth, to try to establish, you know, how much extra can we put on there. Uh, COVID continues. How will that affect? How will that affect your ability to evaluate projects, specifically with respect to site visits? How important is a site visit in the process? Well, this is a very, uh, this is a ver very real problem we're living with right now. Uh, we've uh, in a way, we've been lucky in that the projects we've been evaluating, a lot of them, there's, there is not necessarily, they're at a stage where there's not so much net benefit in visiting. Uh, we've been looking at some projects overseas uh, where we want to have a site visit that we've, we've hired consultants that we trust to do the site visit for us, even within those countries, uh, traveling between provinces or states is prohibited. So then you need, even need to find consultants that you trust in the province or state that you're looking at. So uh, it's becoming more complicated. Uh, in a lot of countries though, there's loopholes, uh, even within Canada, you can figure out a way to make your services an essential service and, and travel. Or in certain cases, we'll we will travel and we will take that 14 day quarantine if, if that's what it takes to, to get boots on the ground. But um, I think people underestimate the value of the site visit. Uh, it comes back to seeing the, the, the lay of the land, but also, you know, the rock, the, the, the testing, speaking to the people, you get a much better sense of management coming back to the John Korzak's question. This, the, the management and knowing what their motivations are and how professional they are is hugely important. And it's extremely difficult to do that over Zoom. You, you guys might think that I'm like a very professional person here, but until you meet me, you, won't, you don't know the truth, right? Um, when the project fails, there's no mention of management team. Is this because you are evaluating purely on the basis of the feasibility of the asset as opposed to the project itself? <laughs> Mentioned. I'm not sure I understand. Is it my management team or the management team of the, the people that built the project? So, so I think if we refer back to some of the failed projects in Canada, 
I think I know what you mean here. Yeah. So okay. So He's, I think he might have kind of answered this one already. Like the it was okay. on the, the idea of like the the study itself versus the. Yeah. So the, if we if we think of behind the study. Yeah. So if we think of of uh, some of the famous Canadian failures, maybe there's a sub 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 plot here for for that where should the management team of that failed company project uh, be held accountable? Uh, I think so to some extent. At the end of the day, the the technical people that provided that feasibility study are parts of they're part of a professional association and theoretically the buck should stop it at them, right? Um, I think there is a lack of accountability overall, given how much money has been lost and our, our reputation and, and as an investable asset is, is, uh, has, has had some damage compared to uh, uh, in the past. Um, what about adding high political risk and high country risk to your first cut in spotting your dogs? Is yeah, so there's actually places you have, if you have a great project in Afghanistan, I'd love to hear more about it. <laughs> no, but there's some, uh, there's some jurisdictions that we, we will not go. Uh, we're often, oftentimes though, when we're, people come to us in those difficult jurisdictions, the project is geologically spectacular and we, we will hear them out. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, um, yeah, I can think of a I can think of about twenty countries where there's there's absolutely no way we we would invest, and it's you know we we actually have uh, you know Sean Rusin spent twenty years in Africa and he knows a lot of the countries and understands the risk, uh, so he's not scared of Africa. He understands the risk, but that also means that we're 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 more likely to uh, invest in North America. That's where investors uh, like seeing our our projects. Uh, how do you forecast price of gold commodities on a long term three years before? Yeah, so this is very difficult. We we especially these days where the spot price is five hundred dollars above the, the the three year average or the the, the bankers forecast prices. Um, we will generally uh, lean on something like the three year average or or the bankers forecast, but it's definitely a crystal ball. Uh, and we will run sensitivities and see, you know, what happens if we go up or down on that scale. But yeah, it's um, any forecast is 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 doomed to be wrong at least uh, most of the time. How important is the credibility of the QPs? Um, I mean, this is uh, it's 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 crucial in terms of when when they, you go to construct a project. Oftentimes, when we peel back a feasibility study or something, we we generally have to redo and re-question every single aspect. So at the end of the day, we're we we come back to relying on our own expertise. Um, but um, it's I've been a QP, I've been in consulting before. It's very difficult, and it's very difficult to have all of the skill sets that are required to to do the job properly. So yeah, it is important, uh, but uh, but to to a certain extent, the the project quality is is definitely will will trump the quality of the QP if if we have the right kind of data. Storage wars is a great analogy. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe we'll just do one more here. We're over by five minutes already. Okay, last one. How do you qualify the need to make a fast decision on a due diligence process? i.e. what point do you comfortably make a decision to move forward? Do you have a minimum criteria? Yeah, this is something we deal with all the time. Uh, usually the, the, the requirements to, to provide the due diligence is unreasonable in terms of timeline. Um, at the end of the day, if we're not comfortable with something, we're comfortable in saying, you know, let's not do this. Or we go back and we say, you know, we'd love to help you. We just need more time. So Either you change the schedule or or you can count us out. I think I'll stop there. Listen, I'm I'm I love I'm I'm enjoying this discussion. If you have anything that you would like for me to to jump in on and, and provide information or whatever, I'll make myself available. 
uh, you can send me an email or, or find me on LinkedIn. I'm pretty much the only Guidiane out there. So if you punch in my name, you should find me pretty easy. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining. I'm happy to see such a huge group. And uh, and I'll uh, swing it back to, I don't know, David, you want to say sign us off? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Guy, for, for the great talk and very fascinating subject. And um, thanks to Rusos and Ian as well for joining. And uh, just to reminder, we have our next meeting will be, uh, I guess, the last Wednesday of November. So I guess it's 20, 25th, November 25th. So watch out for that. And then there's some other events going on that CIM MES is hosting. Um, first one coming up, or most, the one coming up um, right away is the Rocks and Stocks two-day conference. So uh, be on the lookout for that. If, if you found this talk interesting, you'll probably find um, that two day conference interesting as well. And thanks again, everyone. I think participation was great. It was over 200 people. So that, that actually sets a record for uh, CIM and ES discussion meetings. So thank you again to everyone participating and, and of course our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Cheers. See you in our next talk. <laughs>